Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's September 25th. I'm Frank Curtis, the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break down headlines and... Uh, Tell you what's really moving these markets. Bring in the one and only Daniel Creech. How's it going, man? What's happening, Frank? Get ready for the hurricane? Do- Ugh, no, I don't like hurricanes. Dodging hurricanes <laughs> and getting ready for the President's Cup. You know the President's Cups this weekend? Yeah, yeah. I just reminded. I was flipping through the channels and saw it, which is pretty cool. So it should be interesting. Yes. It should be interesting. We'll where see they, what the hurricane they- does, though. It's supposed to make landfall and all that. But man, watching the radar and the computer models, I mean, granted, you know, the media is the media and they're hyping it up. Hopefully it's not terrible, but <laughs> man, you look at these, the radar and stuff it is just massive. And you see the satellite pictures. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's beautiful destruction, Frank. You know, didn't Biden give uh, billions of dollars to like the weather service to, so they could predict weather in, in the latest. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. I think that's the latest bill. Yeah. So the government gives billions of dollars to everybody. It's so, you know, when we first looked at, at the hurricane coming, it was, Looked like it was going to hit Tampa, and then we are on all well, the way in the east coast of Florida, north, northeast, right, Jacksonville. Uh, and then, you know, it hits us, it hits land, and then obviously it calms down and stuff. So, but we still get like a lot of wind and stuff. Now it's being pushed over more into the to the west. So, uh, and this is just a few days away. So we'll see. So, uh, yeah, praying for everyone. Hopefully, yeah, it doesn't hit you too bad. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be a little, a little insane. So I think tomorrow it's going to hit. So hopefully everything's okay. Lots of flooding and stuff like that expected and win. Hopefully it's not too crazy. But um, yeah, definitely not crazy with the markets, right? I mean, look what we're seeing. We're seeing uh pretty much everything at record highs. Right? You got stocks at record highs, and this is all after the 50 basis point cut by the Fed. Gold at record highs. Uh, you have small caps popping. They're not at record highs, though, but this did popping. Bitcoin surging again at 64,000. Remember, it was below 50 not too long ago. Even all coins are popping as well. Biotech, so uh, you know it, it's like a party now. It's it's like a P Diddy party, right? <laughs> oh man, see what you did there. <laughs> the Come P. On. I don't know, I, just I don't opens know about up that. Yeah, that opens up a whole lot. That guy's going to suicide himself. What do you think the over under on that is? Uh, what do you think I'll, he goes the old Epstein route? <clears throat> yeah, the old Epstein I committed suicide route, uh, and nobody has a film of it, even though I'm in jail cell route. Uh, I think he's in big trouble because it kind of is like oh, Epstein. No kidding. I mean, no, I think he's in big trouble in terms, not trouble like he's going to jail for a long time. When you have that kind of leverage to expose people, I mean, Epstein, it's about billionaires, princes and kings and whatever. Uh, You know, when you're looking at all the celebrities, there's a lot of stuff that is going on. People have been deleting Twitter posts. Executives have been suddenly resigning for for different media companies. I mean, there's a lot going on under the hood here. And look, I I have no problem if they're crazy parties and stuff like that. But if it's trafficking and stuff, I I don't, you know, nobody really knows the full story. Everyone says they got videos. And every time I look at a video, it's like, you know, clouded with something not showing. But, uh, you know, his parties have only always been known for being crazy. But you're seeing a lot of exposure even to, to Justin Bieber and and how young he was and put him. I mean, it's it's really insane. And uh, you know, the names in a list that he has and the people that are scared, uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It really is going to be interesting to see what happens. So the way things work and there's so many conspiracy theories out there, like has Epstein with the information he had on the most powerful people in the world commit suicide in jail cell? And still, we don't have any record, nothing, right? no film, no anything. Right, almost never happens. If if you can commit suicide in jail, I, I would think people who are that much trouble, a lot of people would do it. But he was able to do it. Uh, if it was suicide, it's just crazy that um, what gets hidden and you don't know the facts. But that's a very very big. St- I shouldn't even went there. Man. That's a whole podcast by itself, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a wild one. <laughs> well, let's get. It'll, it'll but, be interesting. Yeah, sure. yeah, definitely, definitely. But but let's get to, to the record part because uh, you know again. We cut by 50 basis points. People were worried because the last time the Fed cut by 50 basis points was perfectly positioned for the greatest story ever for people to sell shit is right before the dot-com crash. These are the last two times that they initiated when they first started that cutting. Yeah. And then we saw it, and that was in what? Uh, I think it was in 2000. might have been March. And then we saw that during a credit crisis, which was in 2007. I think that was in September. And then and everyone's like, look what happened afterwards. And, you know, comparing it. It's a good story and it's a good chart to see. But, you know, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Is everything okay now? I wouldn't compare it to those markets just because it's about 
Credit spreads, which is a leading indicator. If you look at credit spreads, they're still very, very low. People still paying their bills. Yes, you're seeing delinquencies go high for subprime and stuff like that. We'll get into that later. But it's definitely a different scenario now with the banks and capital short up than it was back then. But it is interesting that everything is on fire. I mean, I don't think anyone needs us anymore. I don't know why. Don't listen to podcasts. Just buy stop buy anything. Buy any almost anything. Almost anything, right? Yes. Well, the um the key player or the common factor here is obviously liquidity and, you know, uh, the central banks all around the world. You talk about coming together, Frank, not only is our Federal Reserve Bank, but you got Europe and Japan, uh, China now, everybody. China. <laughs> China. <laughs> the chai comms China. are, uh, that's a tip to Rush Limbaugh. But um, everybody is just easing. You have M2, the money supply, <laughs> when you look at it from a macro perspective. It hit its peak in 2022. It's drifted lower, but now it's back on the rise, looking like it's going to take out all-time highs, just like the stocks did. What's wild is, Frank, the narrative has to shift here. I mean, as more data comes out, more events and movement, movements from the Fed on policy, you have to keep shifting. So remember, the narrative was, hey, this market's led by the Magnificent Seven or the top mm -hmm. 10 stocks and all that kind of stuff. You have to see this broadening out. Well, I think as of yesterday, NVIDIA was off about 17%-ish from its all-time highs. But the other broad market, the equal uh, S&P 500, equal-based index and all that, was hitting new all-time highs. And actually, I saw a fun stat. This quarter, the, the third quarter, is the first quarter in almost two years, if it closes out as is, that the other 490 stocks will outperform the top 10 biggest stocks in the yeah. S&P 500. <clears throat> Just a quarter, but it's kind of fun to think about when you look at, hey, everybody was always pointing and saying, listen, uh, this market can't stand up because you only got a few guys <clears throat> pulling you know, the boat and everything. Now, it, to, to Bull's credits, that is actually broadening out, which is positive for markets and such in general. Um, and then you had this September thing. Hey, historically, September sucks for markets. What happened to well, that? Well, that's kind Wasn't of shifting September the narrative. September supposed to be the worst month to stocks? Wasn't commercial real estate going to crash the markets? Anyway, yeah. Well, and those cans are getting kicked down there. Um, I understand your point about if everybody's talking about it, it's already priced in. I do think there's going to be a lot more pain in commercial real estate. I just don't know how broad it's going to be. But when you look at everything as a whole, you have to... You know, you have to say, hey, there is a lot of momentum here. You don't want to fight that to your September comment. I, I don't think that there's a coincidence in it leading up to November. I think October, um, I don't know how you don't get more volatility as you get closer and closer to the election. And then, you know, we're entering that seasonal period for markets and stocks to go, you know, continue higher on a seasonal basis. Frank, I don't know if you checked the latest fact set earnings report, you know, that comes out. But so... For Q3, earnings are expected to grow 4.6%, mm -hmm. okay? That's down from 7.8% earlier in the quarter. Mm -hmm. So expectations go down. You mm -hmm. talk about that a lot. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Now, that's 3.2% is what they've moved lower since the start of the quarter. That sounds like a lot, but it's actually lower than the 5 and 10-year averages. Mm -hmm. So to your point, you know, it you see the headlines, hey, they beat or they missed, but what was the actual, are they growing year over year and yeah, such like that? they're beating analyst estimates, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. what we're looking at, where the analyst estimate could show that, you know, sales year over year are down 25%. They're beating the estimate, but sales are still down 25%, right? So yeah, that's important. But when you look at Q4, earnings are expected to grow 15% mm -hmm. in Q4. Q1 and Q2 of next year, 14.6 and 13.7. Now, granted, those are going to come down as mm -hmm. history is any guide, but that is remarkable for this market in general. And you have liquidity. I'm not saying there's no risk out there. There are. But you clearly have to say, hey, where are we at right now? We're at all-time highs. And here's why and here's what's leading up to it. Stimulus, government stimulus, deficits and money is just going crazy. That's not slowing down down anytime soon. So you can go ahead and lighten up exposure at all-time highs, but you definitely have to be invested <clears throat> Yeah, and, and there's pockets too, because because there's a lot of risks out there. We hear remember commercial real oh, estate, absolutely. right? Where commercial real estate was going to destroy the market. It's the next crisis. It's going to bring down the whole entire you know financial system. That's what we heard. Here's a note from J.P. Morgan. And again, my job is not to to you know promote either way, bullish or bearish. It, what I'm hearing out there, especially on my, when you know for my Twitter feed, you follow certain people, you're in certain algorithms. So you know I could think things are great, and you know you might think things are bad based on the algorithm that you're currently in when it comes to social media. But I could tell you, 
with my feed, 90% of people are bearish and think the market's absolutely going to crash. And they're citing reasons that I just don't get. Like why? Because it's a 50 basis point cut. You're comparing it to other periods, which were totally different than they are now in terms of the banking, in terms of, again, when you're looking at, at credit spreads, the markets, liquidity, I mean, these are below historical norms. You're going to see that spike up tremendously. That's the indicator that you know, the foundation's cracking and recession is coming. So, you know, there's indicators when I've seen that. Then, then you look at commercial real estate and I saw this JP Morgan note, uh, you know, I just, just reading, right, a couple of past reports and it's from May, which is, you know, not too long ago. And I think it's even better now, but they say, and I'll put it up here if you watch on YouTube, it says commercial real estate outlook for the second half of 2024 is largely positive. Multifamily continues to perform as industrial retail, but challenges could lie ahead, especially, say, with the office. But now you're looking at, at what? Amazon, a lot of these companies, they're telling you, listen, you got to get back to the office. If not, you're done. Uh, they say uh, on the pricing side, it's going to be a landmark year, quoting them, quoting J.P. Morgan, right, who's bearish on the overall markets, right? Jamie Dimon thought interest rates are going to go a lot higher. He's, you know, He was one of the ones that, that were very, very cautious. Uh, and he knows everything, by the way. J.P. Morgan was the only bank, I believe, that got the heads up from the Fed saying that, hey, it's going to be a 50 basis point cut this time around because they came out and changed it a couple of days before, which you'll never, ever see unless – and again, the Fed does a good job and tipping its hat because they don't want to surprise people. I get it. But you know, these guys are ahead of the curve, and they're saying on a pricing side, it's going to be a landmark year of commercial real estate uh, when it comes to price discovery – Forecasting transaction activity, loan originations, CMBS issuance to rise 25, 30% relative to 2023 lows. I mean, you got to be careful what you listen to out there. Because if you're listening out there, you're hearing all the shit, the debt concerns and everything. And I, I've pounded this, hopefully, in the past 15 years of doing this podcast and even longer where deficits don't matter. They don't matter. I know it's insane. And you're like, Frank, you're out of your mind. I know we're paying a trillion. It, it, it matters when you can't pay it. When you can't pay it. And are we seeing delinquency rise? We're seeing it, but not on crazy levels. Still not too bad. You know, we're seeing it on subprime levels, which is fine, you know, which is expected. And I'm not telling you that everything's rosy. I'm just saying it's people who are forecasting a credit crisis are out of their mind. Okay, they're out of their mind. I mean, it's a great story and they're selling something likely. But when I when I look at some of the details, let, let's take your earnings, right? You said that I look at facts at earnings, Daniel. So right now we're trading at 21 times forward earnings. The 10 year average is 18. And that's a good 10 year average because interest rates are kind of low, right? We're not taking it when, when you know, we're taking it through, through a, good, a good period. Interest rates are very low. So we're looking at a 10 year average is 18, right? So based on PE alone, we're expensive. We're trading a 17% premium to the average based on PE alone, Daniel. <laughs> What do you think of when I say that? Because that's another thing I try to pound everyone's head. When everyone just cites a PE as the only valuation metric, I don't want to say they're an idiot. I, I, get, I get pissed off Lazy because thinking. it's meaningless unless you're talking about the growth. Because you could have a 30 PE and that's cheap. We learned that 70, 80, 90, even 100 PE on NVIDIA was extremely cheap two, three years ago. And look at the explosion in earnings. Now it's trading at a 28, 30 PE which is in line with Microsoft, which is in line with Apple, yet they're growing earnings by triple digits and expected to do that annually over the next two years. You gotta look at growth because if you just look at a P, you'll never own a growth stock in your life and you'll never hit a grand slam. You'll never hit a grand slam. So let's get back to the S&P 500. 21 times earnings, is that expensive? It's a 17% premium, right? So you're right. But like you said with growth, this year earnings are projected, this year, okay, we already reported too. This year earnings projected to grow 10%. And in 2025, they're expected to grow 15%. So when we look over the past 10 years, the average annual growth is around 8%. So we're growing much faster historically than we've ever been. And at least over the past 10 years. And the next two years, say, listen, 10% 2024, 15% 2023, let's call it 12% annually, average annually, we're going to grow. That's 50% greater than the 8% annually used to growing. So are we expensive based on PE loan? Yes, yes. But earnings are growing much faster, supporting this valuation, at least for now. Could that change? Absolutely. I mean, I could tell you, without a doubt, going back the past 20 years, when I really, really started focusing on earnings and, and loved it and, and earnings calls and really getting into it, uh, I bet against the consumer several times in my career over that time frame. I bet against consumers, and I also bet against the S&P 500 as a whole when it comes at earnings projection, which whatever it is now, it's like 270, all the earnings combined for the S&P 500 companies. I owe, even when I was on Andrew Howard's podcast, I used to, we used to talk about it. 
every single time I bet against it, my track record, that track record makes my Super Bowl track record look freaking absolutely perfect. And I can't pick a Super Bowl save <laughs> my life. I think I'm three for 10 in the last 13 years, whatever it is, right? I'm horrible. But you, you're always wrong. You're always going to be wrong. Uh, it, it, for me, I'm always wrong on that. So when you're seeing the earnings growth, and I said it two years ago, there's no way you're going to say this is before AI really took off. But look at the productivity gains. These guys are laying off employees, lowering their costs significantly, and growing revenue right away. That's productivity growth. They're growing earnings. I mean, you, you see these companies and what they're doing. You know, the reason why I'm citing this is not to sound like someone that's super positive and everything. I always change, you guys know, when the data changes. But th there are positives out there along with the risks that I feel like, you know, if you're mentioning the $500 billion in unrealized losses for banks, why don't you talk about the other side where they have $2.5 trillion of assets? Nobody says that, right? Because it's not a good story. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody, nobody wants, when people come to me, it's so funny, when people on the street come to me, they're like, Frank, and they find out like I'm into stocks or whatever, which, you know, a few people found out because I had a big party for my daughter and we met parents for the first time. They're like, you know, what stock you like? And I'm like, uh, NVIDIA. <laughs> and they're like, oh, well, like it's a disappointment to them, you know? It, it, but the thing is I hate giving, I hate even family members giving away yeah, you know, when they ask me picks and stuff like that, because there's fucking zero upside for me. I mean, if I tell them and they get it right, they're not going to give me any money that they made. And if I'm wrong, they're going to be calling me like every month. They thought you said the buy. They say, there's just no upside of my career. I, mean, I always tell them like the largest stock possible that's doing well in the market. Just buy that one, you'll be fine. My point is, there are risks in the market. Yes, we're playing, paying $1 trillion in, in, just in interest alone on our debt, but we're paying it, right? And now we're seeing rates go lower, uh, you know, I'm looking at the banks with unlo unrealized losses. Yes, that's if they had to sell probably all their short-term bonds right away, which they don't have to do, right? We which is fine. Uh, but I feel like, you know, when you tell this story, it's not exciting. I think that's why we get so many listeners to this podcast because we don't bullshit you, right? So, so there's positives out there. Not everything. I, I would be worried about software companies, cloud companies. I think they're really being threatened by AI, but there's so many pockets of growth out there that are really, really working, especially, you know, you have gold like through the roof. I think that's going to do great, but... You know, uh, I, I one, think one wild risk as well. could happen next uh, at the beginning of the month with the uh, shutdown on the longshoremen. And they're talking about from Maine to Texas, the East Coast, all the logistics and shipping. Did you know Brunswick, just north of us, is like one of the largest auto importers? Hmm. Brunswick. You ever been up there? Mm -mm. I mean, it's cool. Auto? In, in, really? Yeah. Well, yeah that's anyway, big, but yeah. that goes that's into Georgia, effect on yeah. the 1st of October. That is a risk because... Um, you sh sh shut off and kind of clog the supply chains, you're going to have a lot of issues there. Now, we'll see what happens. It's right before an election. You, uh, President Biden does have the authority or opportunity to kind of step in and handle that, which, of course, I think I, if I had to bet on it, he would before the election. But then you have uh, retailers have already stocked up. Containers coming in were up 17% higher year over year to kind of get ready for this. So it's not um, – I like – I like just mentioning it here, Fred, Frank, because you, you don't hear a whole lot of that. I mean, I've seen some headlines, but the impact that it could have, it it should be just like the yeah. 2008 or whatever and like yeah. that. So it's not. And that really caught my eye more than anything else. Hey, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, in fact, w that's one of those situations like debt. If the market does sell off because this strike goes into effect and you start seeing these fears about headlines and these supply chains ruining, you know, Christmas is stolen and all this kind of stuff. That's the time you want to go buy your names because that's an unrelated uh, reason for equities to pull back. That's kind of what you want to look at. But there are risks out there. We're not, we're not permables, of course. But again, just coming back to it, when you have trillion dollar deficits, <laughs> Frank, I'm, I'm kind of tongue in cheek here because you're right. We are paying our debt. We have a Florida printing press. Of course yeah. we're going to pay our debt. Yeah. I mean, we can pay anything. You yep. just print it out of thin air. That will weigh, it does weigh on consumers. You're seeing that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, listen, I, I'm still nervous, which means you have to buy stocks here because if I wouldn't, if I was more confident, the market would probably crash. <laughs> I mean, look, look at oil, look at the energy uh, infrastructure in terms of, of data centers, which we covered. I, I mean, look at AI. It, it's still growing tremendously. There's no slowing down in CapEx, not even close. Yeah, there's just pockets. Bank of America here. said we're in 1996 of the AI thing, Frank. So you got. I, I would I would agree with that. I think you have you know many. It might last a little bit longer, but 1996. Think about. I remember in 1999 the market was incredibly overvalued to start 1999, and I'm like, holy shit, this is going to end badly, and right? It doubled, because right? it doubled that year. <laughs> the Nasdaq doubled that year before a crash, and then it crashed, and it turns out, you know, okay, you're right. You know, it was overvalued, but it just shows you how far. 
markets could go before they reprice, but you have a lot of earnings power behind this. You have a lot of cash behind this, right? So, so he, here's a good example. You have interest rates going down, and I think, Dan, you, you made a great point of it where um, you know, we're looking at stocks at all-time highs and we're cutting rates, right? It's usually the opposite, right? It's usually yeah, when markets see, and housing. <laughs> right? So, but now, look at the difference it makes when you're cutting rates, and this is why it's so big. And, and listen, it, you know, people, they're cutting rates because they probably see the economy so on. I get it. But look what happens you know, over time. And it's already happening very, very quickly. So look at it rates. 15-year mortgage has a four handle on it. It has a four handle on nice. it right now. Right. Okay, it's under 5%. Did you see mortgage refinancing applications? They surged. They're up 20% from the previous week. Now, you may say, well, that's not a good sign because people may need equity and take it out. I'm going to put some perspective for you, okay? Because this is how you have to look at the market and this is how you make money in stocks. Right? I'm, going to, I'm going to put this in perspective for you. It's very important. You could be pissed about the debt. You could say, oh my God, the consumer, my neighbor has two Mercedes, they can't afford it, whatever. You have to look at it from a different perspective because you shouldn't give a shit about anything else other than you making money. And if you're looking to making money, this is a very important step. Okay, the average person right now is sitting on $100,000 in debt. And I don't know if that's an all-time high or whatever. They're paying a crazy, crazy high interest rate on that debt, right? This is the average person in America. 100,000? 100, 100,000 on average. 100,000. So you're talking about, you know, everything, right? Well, you're talking about okay. student loans, Mortgages, whatever. Okay. More, right? Yet, that's a lot of money, 100,000. Do you know the average homeowner has $300,000 in equity in their homes right now? The average person. That's how much they're sitting. So- now they're going to refinance because, hey, you know what? We really need the money. I get it. You have a lot of debt. So think about if you're refinancing and you're taking your current debt, which you're paying what? 22, 23% interest on probably, especially if it's credit cards and things like that. Now you're getting this massive cash infusion. Then you're stretching that debt over many years while lowering your rate to 6%. It's a massive massive lifeline that if you're an investor and you're bearish on consumers and S&P earnings growth and stuff like that, it's huge. And you can say, wow, they're just doing that. Now if home prices come down, and whatever, I, I, I get it. But that's something over the next year or two that's significant. You're put, they're able to put cash in their pockets. Well, some of them might not pay off their debt, but they're definitely going to spend because we know you as consumers love to spend on the stupidest, dumbest stuff ever, like, you know, stuff at five below that, you know, basically breaks three weeks later, you know, and, and, and like crazy stupid shit. But you know, having that cash infusion is huge, right? And, and I feel like people don't talk about that where, wow, I have all this debt. Holy shit, we got to watch out. Now you're able to refinance 6%, 6.5%. Now you're able to pay off that debt, but that's how much home prices have gone up. And yes, they could come down, but I don't think they're going to come down because there's not a large supply of homes. It's why prices keep rising. And it's no bullshit when it comes to prices. And you can say, well, look at this area. Look at, look at the home builders when they report. KB Home just reported. Okay, every home builder reports tell you, tells you the average price that they sold their houses for that quarter. And it just goes up every quarter. This For KB Homes, it was up 3% year over year. Okay, so it's going up, right? So even if they stay the same or go up, even if they come down a little bit, they're up so much, but that equity in the house, they're able to tap. Again, I'm not trying to provide this you know, smooth sailing. What I'm doing is when everyone's completely bearish, I feel like it's our job, right, Dan, to just say, hey, you know, not everything is horrible. Okay, yes, we're expensive, but we're growing earnings much, much faster than we've ever been. You know, I think people are bullish on China and the recent stimulus. It's basically the biggest stimulus package to date, right? So they're reducing their reserve requirements for banks. They're freeing up money so that they can lend to consumers and businesses and also reduce interest rates on loans because it's a freaking absolute, like we said, it's an absolute disaster. So what do we see once this announcement was made, which is, I felt was kind of expected. They just went a little bit you know, more than people thought. We saw a lot of ADRs, the stocks that trade here, China-based stocks go much, much higher, right? And mm -hmm. Shanghai index really took off. So it's going to make it's going to make it a lot easier for consumers, China consumers, to invest in real estate, right? Because now you're reducing, right? When it comes to to how much the loans are, right? It's going to be cheaper, right? And you're cutting interest rates. But I have to tell you, did you hear about that story that's out Wall Street Journal did a good job about, about the Economist that uh, disappeared? Did you see that? The China Economist who was basically like Lee's. No. She's, I mean, she's, she's right, like, like, not right hand, but that was like the main economist. And uh -huh. he, he was talking bad for uh, WhatsApp, which they monitor, right? Everything they monitor. So, uh -oh. and then saying like, you know, she's policies are, are horrible and, and, you know, basically <laughs> he's gone. He disappeared. He disappeared. Oh. He's got, no one can find him, right? He's gone, right? He's, he's has all meetings set up and he's just, and he's gone. Now, 
people might say, well, is this the time to invest in China? And I have to tell you, if you're gonna invest in China, there's one thing that's key. It's the foreign capital. Foreign capital used to flow like insanely to China. And you used to figure it's kind of like the mob when you skim off the skim, you're like, all right, China's gonna fuck us for about 10%. Our profit margins are still gonna be really good, right? That's how, used to, that's how companies probably looked to invest in China. Now it turns out that it's a lot worse than that. And you, you over the past couple of years, you wonder why, you know, what are the stocks are at where they were, where were they 10 years ago, whatever, it's a horrible market, is because of the massive amount of foreign capital that just can't invest there anymore because of the current regime. They can't invest there anymore. They, it's like it's uninvestable, China for foreigners. So unless you see that change, no matter what policies they have, it's not going to come domestically. Maybe we get lucky if the incoming president, whoever it is, signs deals with China partners, we're going to have so much leverage in them, they lower tariffs. Uh, make trade easier. I mean, there's so much that we could do with China. They have rare earth metals, uh, which are critical. You know, there's so many things we could do with China because they, 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 they're so weak right now and we're so strong that we could sign great deals and, and have partnerships to benefit us much more than them. Yeah. Aside from that, you need to see foreign capital coming into that nation before you really decide to, to go all in. It's a nice pop, but that's something I'm still negative on that I think, listen, if you're, if you're like China's coming back at, China's not coming back for a while, guys. I don't care what they, this is like several times they've done this. They lower the reserve requirements. They just, there's just no capital. They're trying to stimulate it. Let's see if this stimulates it at all. I don't even think it's going to matter. I really don't think it's going to matter for China. And you're not, this isn't going to lead to more foreign capital going into that, into China, which is the key if you want to invest there. Because right now they feel like they're really all by themselves. You can't trust them. And no one's really going to invest there. So listen, enjoy the trade. I wouldn't say, hey, China's back at all. But that's something I'm negative on. But again, we want to bring you a lot of the facts, a lot of the data that we see. Because if you don't listen and you don't hear what some people are saying, you would think commercial real estate's bad. The debt's out of control. The dollar's going to lose its reserve currency status. Get all your money out of the country immediately. Get the hell out of here. You're going to die. And it's not the fucking case. Mm. And I read this shit. I'm like, Jesus. I mean, really? These people are really allowed to say they're killing. How many people have been saying, buy gold, the market's going to crash debt levels for freaking 20 years. You've been out of this market because you're listening to some idiot who just has an agenda who, by the way, while you were not in stocks for the past 20 years, this motherfucker made so much money, so much money over those 20 years. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. They made a fortune while you've gotten crushed. You know, it, it, it's crazy. So we want to try to bring you the facts and say, look, don't jump in front of a moving train. You got a lot of momentum in the stocks. Interest rates are coming down. There are positives. I wouldn't say the markets itself all, all together, Daniel, they're all going to go up together, but I'm seeing a lot of pockets where lots of ideas, uh, lots of growth within markets. Again, oil, natural gas, how is it this suppressed when you have this energy boom? That's where it's going to come from. Yes, it's, uranium is great play. I get it. But man, natural gas is, is huge. LNG, huge. You know, just, you know, these markets, there's a lot of places, a lot of stocks to invest in. And now you're seeing oil come down with balance sheets on oil companies. Uh, fantastic. They're, they're raising dividends. Usually when you see oil prices come down, you see these guys are so leveraged, they're going out of business. They, they learned their lessons over the past 15 years through the credit crisis, through COVID. And, and now, you know, they could turn on and turn off oil very, very quickly. So when prices go up and rigs get out there, it's, it's very easy to turn the faucets on and very easy for them to shut it off when things are bad. I think oil prices are going to go a lot higher. I think natural gas prices are going to go higher. I think that market's ripe. I think gold is ripe. I think Bitcoin, you've seen all coins go higher now. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of positives in this market where you could still make a lot of money. Oh, absolutely. And the energy, I mean, we've, we've talked about energy quite a bit and I've been wrong on here. Here's a good learning experience, uh, that I'm living out in front of the, uh, listeners eyes and ears. I have been wrong on the direction of energy prices with oil and natural gas, but we've still had a lot of winners in the energy patches. And that's kind of funny to think about because I was assuming that oil would stay above you know, 80 to 85, it, let's just call it 80 to 95. And here we are at 70, I've already dipped into 60. But as you said, the strong balance sheets in these companies, uh, Quantum Energy CEO had an interesting comment. And he said, you know, speaking of using your language, Frank, about not so much uh, doom and gloom, but he was saying that, listen, the shale oil revolution has peaked and when you look at what that means, he's not saying that <clears throat> shale and fracking and all that is going away. But if you look over the last couple of years, you have to tip your cap to the oil industry for here in the United States. I mean, you more than doubled oil production, tripled natural gas production. I mean, you know, you can use whatever time frame you want. The, the point is to think about doubling ener uh, energy production from current levels over the next year is silly. But that doesn't mean that um, it's not going to continue to maintain. In fact, 
we're just off record highs for production in oil, and we're back to, what, 2022 levels. Mm. So it's flattening out, but you just had, and I'll get into more of this tomorrow on Wall Street Unplugged Premium, <laughs> but you just had Microsoft sign a 20-year power purchasing agreement with, I just wrote it down, Constellation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's massive. That's that's a huge, and you know, you go down that rabbit trail of you know, data line, centers yep. and all mm -hmm. that and back into nuclear and things. So yeah, energy has so many tailwinds, not to mention the geopolitical risk. But if you don't have exposure to energy, you haven't missed anything, prices are still suppressed, and the companies that can make and generate cash flow at current prices are just, I mean, it's hard not to be more bullish on that. So, Yeah, and, and switching tones here where what did we warn you about a month ago? Yeah, is autos. Autos. And why? Because I went to five different, six different dealerships uh, with my daughter trying to get a new car. You guys know the story. And then I was like, holy shit, the amount of cars on these, uh, the inventories is insane. So now because of you guys and, and I have, you know, a great network, I'll go out there and, and there's a lot of people that sell cars in the industry that listen to this. There's a lot of people within the industry all over the place. And I'm saying, Hey, you know, I've never seen inventory levels like this. I mean, it, it, it there was so many freaking cars. It was insane. And then I started really digging into the research, started using contacts. And then I said, guys, I mean, the day supply is is so much higher and cited the companies. Ford's in a lot of trouble. GM's in a lot of trouble. A lot of these companies are in trouble. Toyota's not as bad. They're in be much better shape. And what happened today? Morgan Stanley came out and downgraded Ford to neutral GM to sell. And they also downgraded Rivian. What did they say? Surging inventory levels. as And they said day supply. That's what it's called. Day supplies are quickly approaching pre-COVID levels, which they shouldn't be at those levels because demand is not there. Uh, that should sound familiar, right? And that's what we like doing. I could tell you that the research report Morgan Stanley put out is very, very good. We have access to it. We have access to all these reports. Uh, and Adam Jonas did, did a good job on this. So he says, affordability is stretched as prices are still high, while credit losses and delinquencies are rising. He's right, especially for the subprime. He says, China, and this is, this is interesting, okay? He says, China is going to produce 9 million more cars than it's going to sell domestically. So what do you think they're going to do with those cars? they're going to flood the markets with those cars. Just like when they flood the markets with steel and flood the markets with other commodities and things like that. And it's going to go to Europe, it's going to go to US and wherever. But it's going to result in what? When you have more supply in the market, it means that prices are going to come down. It's going to lead to much higher inventory levels for the Fords and the GMs. And that's what you're seeing within these companies. Now, he also said their capital discipline has been basically terrible, right? They haven't cut back enough on CapEx after going crazy on you know, their EV strategies. But also when he looked at the CapEx, and this is critical, this is critical to understand, the money they're spending is not going into innovation. It's not going into autonomous vehicles. It's not going into AI. So the two things, if you read the report, they have it on CNBC, you can pay for a pro membership. If you, if you see the headlines, they're going to talk about this. I'm going to tell you two things in the report that, that nobody's talking about that's both significant. Okay, that's what you get from this podcast. Okay, really quick here. So Ford and GM got downgraded, yes. But Morgan Stanley, I looked at how much they cut the estimates on Ford. Okay, so Ford, I think they downgraded to neutral GM to sell. And they cut their earnings forecast for Ford by 15% and cut its earnings forecast for GM by 17%. Guys, just know those are massive numbers. Those are massive numbers. Sometimes if you miss by a little bit, a couple pennies or whatever, and you issue a weak yeah. forecast, that is a massive, massive cut. Okay, it's a massive cut. I right, put it in perspective. It's like cutting your target price from 100 to, to 82, 83, 84. That is massive. That's huge. And they just started cutting. I mean, now, yeah, that's one thing. Another thing is it says the biggest winner in all of this is who, which is outside the scope, and he's a, a bull on, is Tesla. Now, what was Elon Musk doing? What was he doing a year ago? Which I criticize the shit out of him, by the way, for doing. He was lowering prices tremendously ahead of China lowering their prices. You know, just, again, pricing all these major guys out of the market. Then he comes out and says, listen, we're investing $10 billion just through Tesla alone with an AI, which is significant. Right? And, and what does he talk about? Thomas, he's always talking about the future, the future, the future. And everybody makes fun of this guy. The future, the Mars. future. He's talking even, That's why. Right? So, so and to put in perspective, when you look at $10 billion on AI, Jim's spending around $2 billion on self-driving cars. They have yet to disclose, and this is from this report, they have yet to disclose any details of any AI strategy. Hmm. 
All right, that's GM. Ford, they don't have an AI strategy or budget allocated to, to anything within AI, right? So these guys with their capital discipline, they're just cutting costs and saying, wow, we need to cut costs. But what you have with Tesla's, they're cutting costs and they're taking that excess capacity for CapEx and they're throwing it into like the next wave of innovation. And it just shows like how different management teams think and how Ford and GM and these guys are so far behind. Like, like Rivian has an AI strategy. That's fine. Again, it took a while for them to get ramped up and 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 EVs. But man, when you're looking at Ford and GM here, yes, you'll see you know mid single single digit PEs. But these guys, y you can't touch them here. They're in a lot of trouble. I'm telling you, they're in a lot of trouble. Ford put out some bullshit report about August sales. Uh, you know, to, to try to alleviate a lot of these concerns. I said it was bullshit. But I mean, how long can these guys remain competitive with Tesla? who's just been light years ahead of the rest of the competition for the past 15 years. And more importantly, Morgan Stanley is just the first of many, many firms. Because now this, again, I like doing this a month ago. I'm going to pat myself on the back because we always admit we're wrong. Take and a bow, I'm, Frank. And I'm taking a bow because I'm, I'm, I love helping subscribers. I don't want you to lose money on shit because you're reading bullshit reports. But I can tell you, now that this is much more highlighted than my little tiny podcast, where Morgan Stanley, that report is everywhere, you're going to see all these analysts start lowering their estimates tremendously. And you're gonna see a lot more downgrades. This is just the first of many, many reports that you're gonna see from sell side analysts that are gonna come out because it's really, really bad in the auto industry right now. And I feel like nobody's really telling that story. So just be careful there. But yeah, it was interesting that, that they came out with that report today and hopefully you guys listen because you definitely, you know, you save money by getting out of Ford and GM. Yeah. Yeah, both have been trending lower. Both are down four to five percent today. So, and they even said expected. with GM, right? We know GM is buying back a shitload of its stock. And they even they mentioned that they said, "Is that the best use of your capital allocation?" Because while you're doing that and you're using that money to buy back your stock, Tesla's using that money to invest in AI into the future. And, and it makes a good point where buybacks are cool if your stock is cheap. If you're lowering earnings yeah. by seventeen percent, that means your stock is not cheap, right? Morgan Stanley follows you said they're saying your stock is not cheap, so you're being you're buying back your stock. I mean. Leon Kuhlman was on TV today. He did a great interview. He said, you know, listen, buybacks, Bed Bath & Beyond was buying back its stock. Intel was buying back a shitload of its stock. It's not always the greatest thing, right? Unless you're buying back your stock when it's cheap. And a lot of companies, their stock's not cheap. I don't think they're crazy expensive here, like we just said. But, you know, are buybacks the way? It depends. If your stock is cheap and you're growing, and that, that's fine. But, you know, with these guys, uh, again, even with that, that buyback in place with GM, they have a sell rating on it. it it's, it's interesting to see what's going to happen to the audience. I think it's going to be a lot more pain, and you're going to see a lot more analysts come out and, and really downgrade the sector. Yeah, so stay away from Ford and GM. Stay away from them. Whatever you do, don't. Ah, i tell you a quick little rabbit trail story here. So I need to get my oil changed and stuff in the truck, and I went and got it done because a friend of mine went to this same dealership and – got whatever done, tires rotated and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. He was pulling his boat because everybody but me has mm -hmm. a boat. Everybody but me and Frank have a boat mm -hmm. in Florida. And his front tire comes off of his truck. Comes off? Comes off. The whole tire. Oh. The whole tire. And this guy is the best. And I say this as a compliment because I'm one of them at heart. This guy is the best redneck. Like when you think of redneck, mm -hmm. this guy is it. Okay? Yeah. And so he's telling me, he says, oh, yeah, I walked it. You know, I had to get the truck towed back to it truck towed back to the Ford dealership and he said they were real accommodative they did everything for me and I said yeah I bet you could have killed somebody died all that so when I went there I said hey you know he was there he had to come back and uh but I thought hell now's the time to go because they are so worried and double checking and triple checking everything now's the time to go get your car worked on there <laughs> so good thing that my uh, friend was doing all right but yeah that's my fun Ford story. So, but yeah, yeah, can you imagine pulling a boat and having your damn tire come off? Holy cow, that's insane. That's yeah. insane. Wow. Nuts. Is so, nuts. after an accident like that's when you want to go to the service dealer because then, you know, they're all dotting their eyes and checking their teeth. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> that's insane. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. And speaking of insane, uh, it's the story of Wall Street Journal, which I thought was, was, was fascinating. It's Sotheby's. So, Sotheby's is owned by a billionaire Patrick Drahi. And uh, the Wall Street Journal reported of, of how, you know, Sotheby's is in a lot of trouble. And Dry is a leverage guy. He owns Altice, which has $27 billion in debt. And Altice, basically, he can't pay it. So he offered to buy back this debt 60 cents on the dollar, which I found interesting. And then the creditors countered and said, well, here's a different deal. And it includes you with no control anymore. <laughs> but he's owned Sotheby's. So I, I don't get this story because Sotheby's was bringing in $7 billion in annual sales the past few years. I couldn't. I don't know if that number is right, but that, that's what they said in the story. Uh 
And now they're running out of cash. They said they're pushing off payments to art shippers and conservators uh, by as much as six months. They gave IOUs to employees instead of you know, their incentives that they make. For, Don't for, get for any the ideas, stuff. Frank. I'm so IOUs, that. so Daniel, I owe you some money. <laughs> it's six months. From now. That's a good idea, man. Wow, it's going to be so innovative. Holy shit, what a great idea, man. I got I to gotta call drug, get him on the podcast. What a great thing. But seriously- how is Sotheby's not the most highest margin business in the world? They make 10% on everything that they sell, and they're kind of a middleman. But then- Well, at least. Some of them are a lot higher than that. Well, they sit on average. I actually looked that up. They sit on average. You're right. It could be higher. But yeah, so then what do, what do they do? This guy's a, a leverage guy. This guy's a leverage guy. And, and I love leverage guys because it, it's kind of funny, right? So, so the business model now includes financing. So- are they buying the art themselves and trying to flip it? I mean, is it they provide access to liquidity? Is that lending people money at super high rates to purchase this art? But, you know, you could have sat back and earned 10% for the rest of your life, right? You got great brand recognition. That's where all the billionaires go to sell all the stuff and to buy all the stuff, right? When it comes to, to, to art and stuff. Uh, but the leverage game is amazing because you want to grow the company much, much more, which by the way, it's not the worst strategy in the world. It's why Warren Buffett is who he is today because he was smart because he took these massive pools of money when it comes to insurance and Geico and everything else that he bought. And then he leveraged those pools incredibly because if you look at insurance, no offense, Daniel, one of the biggest industries, I'm not going to say it's a scam industry because it definitely helps you, but I'm going to say that it's one of the only, only businesses where you have to put all this money up front for something that Probably is not going to happen. And now you're sitting in these massive cash pools, which is why they created these reinsurance companies, well, hedge funds, because they could take that massive pool of money, invest it, and leverage the shit out of it. Now, leverage is a great thing for these people. Why? Because they're leveraging your money. They're not leveraging their money. They're leveraging your money, right? So when they blow up, it's not a big deal. You see these guys blow up. They're already, this guy's already a billionaire. Say if he blows up Altice, he blows up Sotheby's, it's fine. Three months from now, both those businesses are gone, and he's going to be able to raise probably another $10 billion and start another company. That's the way it works with these guys. It's great. So they leverage everything in the assets underneath. And if you do it right, you're great, and you build your company much, much faster. That's why hedge funds love taking over shitty retailers that own their own real estate, because now they can leverage that real estate tremendously and build a brand and then, you know, again, take it private, then go public at much higher. Again, it's all... It's not like about this vision of growing a brand. It's just, hey, you know what? We can leverage the shit out of this and make the most money possible for me. And yeah, if shareholders make out, that's great. If I don't make out and I'm wrong, then you know everyone's going to get just like the banks in a credit crisis, right? Who got stuck with the bill? You, me, taxpayers, right? And what happened to them? Nothing. Now they're still they're three to five times bigger than they've ever been. But the leverage game is interesting just to see what happened there with Sotheby's. But man, you're sitting on a good business model and why did you have to leverage it for? I just don't get it. I, I didn't know that about Sotheby's, I, that it was in trouble. I had no idea until that story. Good yeah, job, I, I um, just quickly for me, this is, I know this is boring. Um, it is kind of a surprise, but it just proves there is nothing new under the sun here. Leverage is such a two-edged sword, it's not funny. You can use it to grow, uh, manage it effectively, but and to your point, this guy isn't going to get hurt. He doesn't, you know, I, I don't want to say he doesn't care. I don't know. But this is the oldest trick, the oldest story in finance. I mean, mm -hmm. you grow, you think, hey, I can do this, blah, blah, blah. I give him credit for, and I should have done this, uh, telling on myself here. I, and it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, but when I moved here, Frank, first time at the end of 2017, I wasn't in a position to buy a house, but I was by the time I could have bought a house, a starter home or whatever you want to call that in 2018 and 2019. And I knew, I didn't know if I would have known exactly, I would have obviously leveraged up. But, you know, when interest rates are crazy low, that's the time, you know, that doesn't mean get over your skis to where you can't afford your payments. But that's when you want to absolutely leverage up, when the market is kind of giving you a fat pitch. And I didn't do that. And of course, you know, you would have made a killing on any real estate. And then I could have sold that and go live in a box and, you know, be good. <laughs> but um, seeing this, just reading that article you passed to me, I, I mean, it is, it's, it just kind of makes me laugh, not in... In, in joy or anything that somebody's getting hurt, but it's just like, man, no such thing is enough. And you just think, oh, I'll leverage this. And then, you know, it all comes crashing down. So yeah. I love the line, uh, who says, uh, when you owe the bank a, a million dollars, you got a problem. When you owe them a billion dollars, they got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's how you use leverage. If you're going to borrow, <laughs> get so freaking over leverage that yeah. you're going to destroy the entire company. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. And, and you know what? It, it's, when you talk about Sotheby's and collectibles, it's a good segue into NFTs because- uh, NFTs and non-fungible tokens, which is basically digital contracts, right? Showing ownership of something. So it could be digital art. You could use these to have, you know, special access to something, uh, you know, collectibles, any asset. And, you know, two weeks ago, the SC, right? Gary Gensler, uh, sent the Wells letter to open seas out of nowhere. 
which is the premier platform to buy and sell NFTs. And they basically said that these are securities. NFTs are securities. And in fact, they just settled its first NFT case with a company called Impact Theory, another platform who paid the SEC $6 million for selling unregistered NFTs. So they're saying NFTs needs to be registered. And I thought this was interesting because this is the SEC. It's what I hate about them because they on purpose provide vague regulations, especially when it comes to you know cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology, that it allows them to target anyone they don't like. And you could sue whoever you want because the rules are so vague. And even if you look at the definition of security based on ACC, it's an asset you buy that you think you're going to make money on that's promoted by a third party. That's my sneakers, right? I just bought sneakers yesterday. I think it's Hoka's the name. Holy cow, they're, they're amazing. Like they make you taller anyway, but not that I wanted that. <laughs> I, I didn't even know that. I feel they like make I, you taller. They, but they have well, they like technology that, you know, I never realized it because a lot of pressure is on the front of my foot. And, and I'm, you know, again, I, you kind of get used to it or whatever, but they have technology where, uh, and the guy was explaining it to me, and they're very nice sneakers. Those in, how in, much in are these sneakers? Others. I they like were, how you say sneakers. By the way, I don't think I've ever heard you say shoes. Sneakers. The sneakers and the shoes. There's two different things. Oh, right? That's a different topic. Anyway, yeah. how much are these sneakers? <laughs> uh, Hundred and fifty bucks. Ah, that's not as much. As so I usually pay, you know, and these are like sneakers that I just walk around in, which I'm wearing right now. But I usually pay $75, $80, but you know, I'm going to have them for a while and months and months and stuff like that. So it's definitely worth the investment. But wow, I could see the difference in comfort where it shifts that weight and the balance. And again, I had two back surgery. Anyway, uh, I could take those sneakers and according to definition of SEC, it is a security, which is interesting, right? Because, hey, I bought these sneakers and you know what? Maybe I believe they're like Air Jordans where people buy them and they could be worth more money. I only wear them once and it's a special edition or whatever. And I go on Facebook Marketplace and say, hey guys, you want to buy these sneakers for $180? I bought them for 150 Technically, based on the definition, the SEC can come after me and, and, and find me because that's security based on the definition, which is insane. Now, I want you to listen to this exchange because, what was it, Daniel? You said that... I only saw Gary Gensler in this. He was on the Hill, but you said all the SEC. I mean, no, all five. Um, what's the word? Commissioners. Yeah, Commissioner Hester Pierce was on there. Who we interviewed, who's in favor of crypto. She was great. I actually had a great interview. I'm gonna try to get her on. She was she was awesome by the SEC. But this is a, a, a back and forth between Gary Gensler, you know, who's on a Hill testifying, whatever, and Richie Torres, who's a, a representative Democrat in, in South Bronx District in New York, and he's 36 years old. He understands the NFT market. He's in the NFT market. If you look at people under 40, they understand like cryptos, NFTs a lot more. It's like, you know, again, that's what they're growing up with. Uh, and he started questioning him about the difference between a Yankee ticket that offers some access to something and an NFT. And he gave an example of this thing, Stoner Cats, that also give people access to their animated web series. And I, I found this fascinating and I just wanted to play this for you really, really quick. So you can listen to it. Okay, let me just bring it up and go right here. Uh, and why, why is AMP taking out of security? Well, it's, it's really a question, and the courts have been clear on this, is, is the offer and sale. So specifically with a Yankee ticket, though. What, when, when you're buying a Yankee ticket, what are you purchasing? You're buying... It, it, Access to a Yankee game, is that fair to say? <laughs> I, I understand. It's been a while since I went to a Yankee game. But fair enough. That's, You're welcome to I a Yankee game. I used to live in New York, and my three right. daughters were all born in New so York. So in the Stoner Cats case, uh, the creators were selling an NFT that offered access to an animated web series. From the standpoint of federal securities law, is there a legal difference between buying a Yankee ticket that offers you the experience of a Yankee game and buying an NFT that offers you the experience of an animated web series. Uh, again, I don't want to comment on any one specific. Uh, well, the, it was a settlement. It's a fait accompli. But, but, it's not an ongoing litigation. You can comment on but it. But it's it's about how is something offer and sold? Is it offer and sold as an investment contract? Are are individuals looking to a common enterprise anticipating profits based on the? Well, I'm profits? familiar with the definition. You're avoiding the question. Um, I mean, I, I found that fascinating because it was such a great question. I bring this up all the time in terms of like sneakers and how vague the definition is. But uh, I'm glad he brought that up because it is vague. It need, You need regulation around this. And it's why even with the crypto industry, when you look at it, it's, you know, 
it makes it so tough a capital to flow into the industry if you're not able to define capital or not. But it's crazy. I thought that was great. I, th- I just thought that was a great exchange. And he had to, you know, again, ask him, ask him that question directly. Nobody wants to ask these questions. I don't know why. Even when you have Jamie Dimon on, ask him questions. Ask him, that's what he's there for. Don't give him layups. Oh, what do you think about the consumer? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? You know, seriously, ask him questions, like like detailed questions about commercial real estate, about debt, about delinquency rates, about, you know, why does he hate crypto so much? And crypto's done so, have you changed your mind? Just ask him some of these questions. I just feel like they're all layups. I like what this guy did here, you know? Yeah, I, I, I've i gotten through about half of that. I didn't get to that part, but maybe not half. But yeah, most of the, it was mostly grandstanding, but that was a good exchange. I mean, that's that's great. Listen, this is just terrible. Um, they are a political organization. You know, I won't rant about this, but you can clearly see through them dragging the feet. Enforcement through fines and litigation and stuff is not a business pro-friendly mm-hmm. environment. That's uh, to protect those that they serve on the banking side. I get that. Crypto kind of busts that wide open. Uh, we all know that story. Crypto is winning to a certain extent, but we'll just see how it plays out here. But uh, for as long as I've been following Bitcoin at all, the biggest risk will continue to be the exact same thing, and that is governments. And that's unfortunate, but that's the world we live in. And even with our security token, that that's, I launched it because, not even based on a definite, I mean, th- if you're looking at the crypto markets, not what we did, where we have our CRUZ token, where, where you know we tokenize it and you're getting equity stake in our business, you go participate in our growth. But when you're looking at the utility tokens, which have no equity value, they basically, you know, the value is based on the utility feature, I thought all those are going to, they are securities, right? People buy them to make money. Those are securities. I thought that was going to go away because once you announce the securities, I would say 90% of the industry is gone because they're not going to disclose the shit that they do. When you have how much they're selling and all the stuff, where the money's going to, that they, you know, if you did an ICO, which is like an IPO, but they call it initial coin offering in that industry, you know, that's a, that's a means of security, right? So, uh, and this is significant and why T0 a couple of weeks ago receiving its special purpose license, that broker license, it's, it's a game changer. I mean, it's going to ignite tokenization, the fractional ownership, an industry literally in the hundreds of trillions of dollars when you're including real estate, you're including bonds, any asset in the world you could sell a fraction of to hundreds of millions of investors that never had access to it before. Maybe commercial real estate, maybe bonds, right? Well, we, you know, again, those are institutional markets. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, even your home value, why do you have to go to the bank for Imagine if you could sell off a piece of your home and pay interest on it. Now I own it. You're paying interest on that. You could pay whatever interest rate. Say say if you have several homes and you're using them as rental properties, you're paying that rental rate. Say if you're paying 10% you know, and you have homes of $5 million, just say, oh, I'd say $10 million. Now you're selling off $2 million of that. You're going to get a check for $2 million, which is great, right, for your investors. Now that, that part, just like a stock, a portion of it, right, those shares – are going to be trading, and that's going to determine the value. And now people can invest in these houses. Not only that, say if you sell all your commercial real estate at a much, much higher price, the people who have the fractional ownership, just like a stock, are going to make out. It, it just makes so much sense to me. But T0 receiving that license, the second company in the United States that received a license, the other companies trading utility tokens. So you're looking at T0 being on this island by itself where you're going to see a massive inflow of digital assets flowing to this. I'm already getting calls from people saying, hey, Frank, I know you did your token and, and you know, I, I want to get your advice. Like, how do I do this? Because now this is opened up and now you have a clear path because there's regulation that this, this special purpose license to trade digital assets, it's providing, now they can have custody. Now they can do peer to peer trading. Now you have automated trading. Now they can raise money just like a typical, and it's SEC FINRA related. So now you have a structure, whatever it is. Even if you overregulate a little bit, when you have the structure, what does this do? Now the outside capital of tens of billions that wants to flow into digital assets, they know the structure. Otherwise, they're putting this money into these platforms, into security tokens or whatever, and they don't know the fucking rules because the SEC doesn't define it. Now they know the rules. So when I see this and what they did, and again, our token trades on this exchange, I'm very, very happy, and it's limited to five or six of them for such a long time, and they had their hands tied you know, already they're starting to raise money for companies. They're doing. It, it's really exciting what you're going to see. You know this this revolution take off. I mean, I could see hundreds of these things trading on T zero in two to three years, and it's going to result in explosion of liquidity, right? And, and if I look at the two major headwinds of this industry, Daniel, it's it's regulation and liquidity. Okay, that's what prevented scale, and now regulation is no longer an issue with the special purpose broker deal license. It's gonna pave the way with tens of billions of new capital flow into the industry, but now liquidity is no longer gonna be a headwind 
you're going to see more people file for this, more people to do this, more people on a platform, which is huge because doing this past four years with my investors, it's tough not having liquidity. I want You should have the option to sell or buy based on whatever. Uh, and now you're going to have that opportunity. So it's going to pave the way for the, for the digital security revolution. I, I would hold on for the ride. I think it's finally here. I was early to the party. It's really, really exciting. And it's great news to come out since, as I said last week, we are doing a capital raise, which we're doing great on. It's fantastic. I, uh, you have the option to talk to me. Again, you got to be a credit investor. Unfortunately, that's how it's structured. It's a $25,000 minimum. But if anyone's interested uh, in seeing, we, I put together a nice video, uh, all the details and the facts and everything. And we also have the terms, the agreements, if you're interested in seeing that. And after you do that, if you're like, hey, I still have further questions and you're really serious about it, I have a link to my calendar where you set up a one-on-one -on -one call. And I have to tell you, man, I think I'm on like, I think 40 calls so far, and about 90% of them came in. And then I have all calls set up, you know, for the next two weeks, which is really exciting because, you know, the terms of this deal is, is a 10% dividend that we're going to pay uh, with the option to convert it back in a token at, at 350. So, uh, and a lot of good things going on for our business. So if you're interested in that, frankcruiserresearch.com. But man, that news came out. It's a real positive in the middle of what we're doing because, uh, you know, that's what I want to see my investors, people who back me. People, I mean, my investors back me on this idea when they really – didn't understand it, right? And, and I'm like, dude, I really want to make this work out for you. And now, you know, the company doing really well right now. Things uh, are flowing and, and launched a new division, which is doing well already. Uh, it's really exciting times for us. So I want to put this on steroids, which is the reason why we're raising money. We're not raising it just to, you know, shore up a balance sheet or pay employees or anything like that. No, th this is pure growth. And the fact that this news came out is really, really exciting. I think investors are going to be pretty happy. So uh, exciting stuff. But anyway, uh, just that SEC conversation and just how he was stumped. And again, I don't know if you could see if you listen to iTunes, but I actually played it and showed it and you just see Gensler going, I, I don't know. The he just doesn't know the difference. And, and it's on purpose, right? It's done on purpose. So so I just don't- He knows the difference. You just can't say it out loud. You don't want to say the quiet part out loud when you're part of a scam, Frank. <laughs> pretty much, pretty Elmer much. Fudd. But it is, uh, yeah, it is crazy. And it's interesting to see if Trump does get elected, what he's really going to do for crypto, what he said. Because now we know that the other side is trying to, I think they met with Galaxy Digital Novogratz. They met with, uh, who else did they meet with? Who, who's the guy that I've had? I didn't see that. I yeah. didn't see him meet with Novogratz. And they met with um, Mooch. Oh. And this guy Mooch, who had on the podcast, who, who I like. You know, I, I just I don't like that you got mad at Donald Trump and changed your whole philosophy on life. I mean, you could hate a guy and still be, you know, have the values that support what side you're on, whatever that is. I mean, you know, and that's fine. Whatever you got to vote for, vote for. But- you know, for these guys who they revolve their businesses around crypto and they've gotten annihilated because of the current regulation, which is illegally going after the banks and crypto. And now you're getting promises only because money's coming into the sector. Uh, at least Donald Trump, when he was president, he didn't go after these guys. He just said, oh, you know, I think Bitcoin's bullshit. And he switched because of the money. Fine. Good job. I just hope that both of the, I mean, the path for crypto to disrupt finance, which is the biggest boys club, it's right in front of us and it's going to be massive, but you have to have the right person that's going to allow it. And, and I feel more comfortable saying that Donald Trump is going to be very, very, very good for crypto. And it's still a question mark on the other side. But if Trump gets in, you are going to see innovation in the crypto industry. That's unbelievable. The companies that I have in our portfolio, the stuff that they do, things, terms you never heard of, like, like Dow and, and it's just, you know, the ownership structure, the, the, the community structure where, you know, licensing data center and, and, and GPU capacity uh, to outside sources at cheaper prices. I mean, it, it's just remarkable the innovation that takes place when it comes to the blockchain and comes to some crypto companies because, man, it's really incredible. But there is a lot of shit in that industry. It will unleash like this whole innovative trend and really disrupt finance. Who, what do they do? Do they create anything? No, they, they just charge massive fees and, and a middleman or everything. You know, let's let's face it. That's what it is. And then they pay tons of lobbying dollars, right? So you can see why the politicians are protecting them. But I think this is going to change. Let's see. Hopefully, it doesn't matter who gets elected. I don't know, but I hope it changes because crypto is really ripe to go higher, and that's why I think you know Bitcoin is going to surge again. And you're seeing it. Everything's everything says Bitcoin should be under fifty thousand right now, and it's sixty three. Every time you get this head fake, it goes right back up. I don't think you're going to get the head fake this time. I think from here on in, I think by the end of the year, you're going to see a nice surge in Bitcoin. And now you're starting to see it filter over into a lot of other tokens, good companies and tokens that have gotten annihilated. And that's why I basically was pushing my uh, Curzio Venture newsletter. Or not the Curzio Venture, but the Curzio uh, um, Crypto. And also, which you have things in as well, with the Crypto Newsletter, but also the um, 
basically all the news and small caps that are going in there. It's really exciting times with digital assets. It really, really is. So uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Lots of ideas in that space. Lots of ideas. Yep. Yeah, the T0, hopefully that opens up the floodgates and we get that surge of uh, investors and liquidity. So yeah, cheers to that. Cool. So man, covered a lot. Tomorrow's Wall Street plug premium. Micron's reporting, right? We got some news coming out. Tonight, yep. Couple of That's going to be an interesting report. It's amazing because you wouldn't think, it's really sharply down from its highs, but been running up to into this quarter, so expectations are high. Let's see what they say, especially on the AI front. Some companies like Salesforce, some companies like Snowflake are getting killed with AI, even though they say, we're AI, we're AI, and you can tell by the big investments that they make. Uh, but it's going to be interesting. So, uh, And we'll get into more detail on plays, on stocks, you know, uh, within a lot of sectors that we mentioned today, you know, what could be plays with, with a little bit of China exposure? Do you want to get out of some of the stocks? So we really talk in depth in that podcast. And that podcast, enjoy it now because it's going to change because the price is $10 a month. Uh, but it also includes Dollar Stock Club, which is pretty cool. And that's a trading newsletter. And Daniel and I usually have an idea a week. And usually it's based on what we see in the markets and what we just talked about. But we're probably going to separate that newsletter out of that. But um you know, so if you're going to join, join now. It's ten dollars a month. It's really, really cool, and, and I feel like I, I don't mention that a lot or enough because it's a really, really good podcast, guys. And, and you can subscribe. I think I think we had special like a dollar, and if you don't like it, you can cancel. But I'm saying, anyone subscribes, really, uh, you know, subscribes long term because you get a lot of value out of it, and it just we're unleashed. We don't have to hold back anything, and, and we tell it how it is, and and it's behind a paywall, which is really cool. So we're able to talk about a lot of different stocks, even some stocks in the portfolio and things like that, which is a lot of fun. But other than that, enjoy the Presidents Cup. Enjoy football. That Eagles win was really impressive. Holy cow. Did you watch football this week, Daniel, or no? Uh, I saw some highlights, yeah. I saw a little bit of it. I didn't see the Eagles. The Eagles should have crushed. I mean, I think New Orleans, New Orleans is for real, but, you know. Oh, I did see the one uh, long it? run. I mean. I saw uh, that play. Yeah, uh, Barkley's amazing. But, uh, yeah, it's crazy with the Eagles because uh, – if you have Hurts throwing an interception, I think it's seven straight games, and he also fumbled, and they still beat them at New Orleans. Uh, it is interesting. A lot of teams, a lot of good teams lost, especially in the NFC. That was supposed to be really, really good out of nowhere. So it's just, it's just I love football. It just changes week from week, and anyone can beat anyone. So it's a lot of fun. President's Cup, enjoy. But for you, Wall Street Unplugged Premium members, we're going to see you tomorrow. Any parting thoughts, Dan? No, nothing from me. I love when you say see that. See you tomorrow. I love when you say that. All right, guys, we'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Love this episode of Wall Street Unplugged. I think you'll really love Wall Street Unplugged Premium. The Wall Street Unplugged Premium is my members-only podcast where I dive even deeper into this week's events. While I'll do even more than tell you what's moving these markets. I'll tell you specifically what moves you can make today. So this is going to be about trading. Put big money in your pocket right away due to the inconsistencies I see daily in the market. I'm talking about specific investment ideas I'm recommending and tracking each week that I believe will be impacted directly by everything I just talked about today. Plus, you're going to get the chance to go even further down the rabbit hole with me and my co-host, who's Daniel Creech, as we discuss which of these week's trends could turn into massive windfalls. Could the big trends that we see lurking on the horizon, also the news we're picking up from our network of insiders, which has gotten bigger and bigger thanks to you and so many people listening to this podcast in over 100 countries. And you get a chance to talk to me directly in my special Ask Me Anything Q&A session. All of that and a lot more, like premium interviews with world leaders in finance, technology, industry, and politics. This is all part of Wall Street Unplugged Premium. And becoming a member is super simple and super cheap. So I don't know, but at wsuoffer.com to check it all out, sign up today, and you won't miss a thing. That's wsuoffer.com. Wall Street Unplugged is produced by Curzio Research, one of the most respected financial media companies in the industry. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its host and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.